As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. This is Lentalk 71. We used to call them vlogs, but it's such an ugly word. I'm going to change it to Lentalks. These are the lectionary Lentalks. We'll have other kinds of Lentalks, and I may do a Facebook Live explaining uh, what's going on with Preach the Story. But this is lectionary Lentalk number 71, and the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. And I want to just... Uh, really plant ourselves on one passage in particular. So I, I just want to make some suggestions about two that you could bring together. The second Kings text and the, the John text, the, the feeding of the thousands that Jesus did. Both of them uh, involve leftovers. And, and we need a theology of leftovers. What do you do? There's an ethics to what you do with the leftovers. Do you keep them for yourself? Do you share them? Do you build bigger barns to hoard them? Um, so that's a whole other uh, direction you could take your people on. There's also in this uh, John story, and you could also um, make it and reframe the, the Second King story, so it includes this too, but Jesus is, is testing his disciples. Now test, when we have a test, it means you take a test, you get judged basically. But no, we, we all have... Uh, things that test us and make us grow stronger. Is Jesus helping the faith of his disciples to grow stronger? He tests them in a couple ways. And um, one way he, he tests them is uh, he sends them off uh, in one direction, tells them, you go on ahead and I'm going to stay behind and I'll, I'll catch up with you. They didn't have any idea I was going to catch up with them. Of course, how he catched up with them is walk down the water. But he tests them and... Um, I, I did a whole other Len talk on this, and maybe I'll just reference that one here. But he, he also tests them in terms of um, how are we going to get the food? I'm going to feed them. They're hungry. I'm going to feed them. How are we going to get the food? Well, all we've got here. So do, do they have the faith enough to trust him, especially when he tells everybody to sit down? In other words, you got to trust me as part of this test. Uh, sit down enough so you can't feed yourself, but I'm the one to feed you. But the real passage I want, I want us to, to park on and, and spend some time on is this Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. And it ends uh, toward the end. It, not, not, I think it's verse 19 here, where it calls us to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. To be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's why I titled this, are you full of it? Or what are you full of? <laughs> um, and let me just read that last, uh, last slide, that last section. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. It, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and grounded in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp, I love this, how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Well, what are you full of? Are you full of this measure of the fullness of Christ? I think we are full of it, people. We are full of it. The problem is what we may be full of is not the right things. I think you can make a case that we live in a world that is, if you say full of it, the it is two things, religion and politics. 
We're full of religion and we're full of politics. And that's the problem. Now, I'm a big supporter of both religion and politics. Let, let, me, let me take religion first. I don't think, now there's a lot of people who are disagreeing with me, especially today, but I don't think you can have faith without religion. I do not understand this spiritual but not religious, SBNR they get called, or SBNA, spiritual but not affiliated category. If you have some kind of spirituality, if you have some kind of faith, you have to express it. How do you express it? Rites, rituals, practices, uh, songs that you like, um, beliefs that you, you share. And that ultimately, that expression of your faith is called religion. You, you can't have a faith or spirituality without it forming some kind of a a religion, even an atheist claim. No, we're a religion too. Um, you know, we, we have our own practices. We have our own, um, and they, 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 some even call them churches. They have atheist churches. Uh, so I don't, I don't think, and I think atheists are right. They are religion. Give it to them. But is it, what kind of religion is it? And now, I, I know that the religion never occurs in the Old Testament or in the Gospels. It's rarely in the epistles. You know, I could only count basically seven where I found that word that we could legitimately translate as religion. It's a concept. It's missing from Judaism. I still use it, although I use it very, very carefully um, because you can't get rid of religion. You throw it out the door, it'll come back in through the cracks. It'll come back in through the windows. You cannot escape religion. But hear me, Jesus did not come. He did not come to bring us a certain religion. He did not come to bring us a new religion. He came to show us a new way of living and moving and being in the world, a new faith that shows us how to be the original human being God made us to be. What happens is, sometimes that expression of faith, that religion, becomes the faith itself. And so religion itself becomes the religion. Let me repeat this, because this is key here to understanding what's, what we're full of. It's not the faith anymore that expresses itself in religious form. It's that religious form. Religion itself becomes the religion. So it's not a faith in God or faith in Christ. It's a faith in religion. And that is, sisters and brothers, idolatry. That is the essence of the idolatry. And that's what we're full of today. The idolatry of religion. Now, let's take politics. To say the word social gospel is to say two things at the same time. Scholars call that a tautology, a pleonasm. But you're saying the same word twice um, because any gospel which isn't social isn't the gospel. I mean, the gospel is by definition. Jesus didn't just come to to save your soul. He came to save all. For God so loved the world, not for God so loved your soul. For God so loved the world, the totality of, of all of who we, all of who we are. So any gospel which isn't social isn't the gospel. Any gospel that doesn't embrace social justice is not the gospel. The gospel calls us to Micah 6, 8. To love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly. Notice what it says. To love mercy, do justice. You don't love justice. You love mercy. And to walk humbly. And that's what social justice means. Love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly. And just like you can't live out your faith without religion, so you can't live out a life of social justice without politics. The politics is the varying means to bring about the end which is justice. But Jesus did not come to call us to a certain politics, just like he didn't come to call us to a certain religion. 
He came to call us to a new understanding, a reframing, a re-enchantment of Micah 6, 8, if you will, this, this understanding of what Jesus, uh, justice, is, is all about. The problem is, is that sometimes that specific implementation of social justice, that politics, you know what's going to come next, becomes the politics. So the politics itself becomes the social justice. Let me repeat that. The politics itself becomes the social justice. So if you're not part of my politics, um, we, we send them off to, the, to, the, uh, to be smitten with the Hittites and the Amorites. And that's idolatry. And that's what we're full of today. The idolatry of religion, the idolatry of politics. And so let me, let me address this really quickly, the, the religion one first and then the politics ones. One of the reasons people are leaving or, organized religion and the church is precisely here. Um, we've made Christianity into a religion and our religion is that religion. We've made being a follower of Christ into a religion. And really now we're not a follower of Christ, but we're a follower of a religion. What is this culture here when it hears the words church going people? Does it hear something good? Well, what is it here when it hears the words good church going people? Uh, come on, I want, I want you to come to me and you'll meet some good church going people. Oh, really? Um, there is a sign in front of a church. We love hurting people. And Jesus is pictured as putting his hand in front of his head like this and just shaking his head in frustration. And that, that's what church going, we love hurting people. We love to hurt people. My mother had a saying, you'll suffer as much from the church as for it. Um, and that is one of the reasons, I think, why the fastest growing religion in the U.S. are now the nuns. A third of the population in the U.S. are not just atheists or agnostics, but nothing in particular, nuns. And we, I'm going to give you a statistic here, and I usually, you know, I'm all about stories, not stats, but this is a huge stat. Since 2008, and it self carries the story of what we've done to faith as we've turned it into a religion. And it is driving people away. Since 2008, Christianity in the U.S. has dwindled by 60%. Now, I just want you to hear this. 2008. That's 15 years. All of you can remember 2008. It's on your watch. It's on my watch. Christianity in the U.S. has dwindled by 60%. And we think, oh, everything's fine. We just don't be a doomsayer. I want to be a doomslayer. Do something where something is not right. Something we're not doing right. For the first time in U.S. history, the majority of Americans do not belong to a church. First time. I was arguing with a church consultant. A church has needed to be less oriented towards church growth and more oriented towards reproduction of the faith. Not filling pews with people, but filling hearts with Christ. And to my face, this church consultant bragged about his methods. And these were his exact words. I fix churches. Jesus doesn't. Let me repeat. I fix churches. Jesus doesn't. And so we can now explain our successful churches, really, without the Holy Spirit, without Jesus. You don't need the Holy Spirit or Jesus to do a successful church. You just need the right marketers or buzzketeers or management strategies or leadership principles. Are you kidding me? Is this what we've come to? And even when we're doing, quote, successful church, there's this, is it a living, vibrant, breathing faith? Or 
when people think of church-going people, do they think of a formaldehyde phase where religion is everything? Now, I want to say something about politics. Um, not just has faith become a religion, and the religion is a religion, but politics has become a religion. In fact, I would argue that politics is the golden calf religion of our day, and it's destroying the neighborhood, as we talked about last week. If you doubt that politics has replaced religion as a religion, consider this. I, as a child, I remember conversations that my, parent, my mother and father had with my brothers and I, the three of us, over, can you marry somebody outside your religious tribe? They didn't call it tribe. They call it the Pilgrim Holiness Church. In other words, should we as boys ever considering marry, marrying somebody else who wasn't a PH? <laughs> okay, Pilgrim Holiness. Then we got kicked out of the PH. We became a free Methodist. Uh, should you marry anybody who wasn't an FM? Free Methodist. And then, you know, the Methodists took us in because they'll take anybody. When my mother got kicked out of the Free Methodist Church, and can you marry anybody who's not a Methodist? These were legitimate, serious conversations that were had in the sweet household. Then it became, um, should, should Protestants marry Catholics? Can Catholics marry Protestants? Um, th then it became, can Christians marry people of other religions? Can Christians marry non-Christians? Can Christians marry atheists? And then it became um, not even an issue. <laughs> the issue today is, can a Democrat marry a Republican? Can a Republican marry a Democrat? In fact, the statistics are that both Democrats and Republicans are on record as saying, if you are one, you shouldn't marry somebody of another religion or party. How many of our churches are party specific? Um, no, I would not share my life with a person of a different political persuasion is the overwhelming answer. Religious convictions are of no consequence in comparison to political affiliations. Um, life is larger than politics or economics or any of the other idols that we have. And faith commitment is not the same as political commitments in which you take sides and taking sides takes over. Faith commitment is all about relationships and ends. Political commitments are all about principles, propositions, doctrines, ideologies, and means. I'm going to stick with them and I'm going to make the means the ends. Um, I have an anti-politics, or should say more say anti-party politics. And people, some people find me on both sides too politically complacent. I find them too politically compliant and to the wrong political sphere. Their politics is all about country. It's not about kingdom and church. And it's too condescending to other powers and authorities as if our salvation lie in politics or our problems were solved in political solutions. My highest political commitment is to the Church of Jesus Christ and the Kingdom of God. By church, I don't mean small c, I mean big c. Which makes party politics as we know it, as we know it, an idolatrous distraction. The church is not, it churches to hold all government's feet to the fire. No matter what that government or party is, we are not to be foot warmers for any state or party. God is, has no more special interest in the United States of America than in, in, in China or in Tibet or in Russia or in Bangladesh. We have a God of all nations. You didn't have nations until the 17th century. So it's just a relatively recent construct in, in history. 
God did not say, I will send you politicians to save you. God did not send us politicians who would save us and bring us nearer, 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 precious Lord. Jesus did not say your salvation is found in politics. No, social justice has political consequences. consequences. But the politics is not the social justice. Do we really think that a change of party is going to make a huge difference and will bring lasting change in our world? Only a change of heart. Only, and here we come, the fullness of Christ, the power of God working through us. Only with that can we do abundantly above all. Um, this refusal to let politics become a religion is really what got Socrates killed. And then I'm going to get off this little politics rant here. But Socrates was celebrated as the wisest person in Athens, but he refused to engage in politics, which had reached a religious fervor in his lifetime, and he critiqued it as a new religion. He was accused of not speaking up, and thereby, by not speaking up, endorsing all sorts of nefarious things. He was accused of a totalitarianism, anti-democratic sensibilities, authoritarianism, and this is what brought him to trial, partly. And Socrates, at that point, professed a deep love for Athens and an abiding concern for its welfare, but he refused to enter the political fray on its own terms, but stood back asking people to look at what was going on from different angles and look what you're saying here and look what this people over here are saying and to find more lasting and abiding solutions to their problems. Um, Paul Cartledge, who's a British expert on ancient democracy, says that Socrates was not a quietist, but he disagreed with other Athenians who, quote, saw politics like religion as something to be done in public. This call to social justice is not a call to start another social program or to make the kingdom into a social program, but the call to live teleologically, the call to live life in a human dimension that is truly divine and one that looks toward the future and toward the kingdom, and toward jubilee. But also one that expects that we all see through a glass dimly, that we know only in part. One day we'll be known as we are known, but until then we stand equally at the foot of the cross, and all of us are sometimes, you ready? Wrong. To the politics of Jesus is Conservatives, you ought to be listening to the concerns of liberals without calling them every name in the book, from Colin, from communist to Stalinist to whatever else you want to come up with, Marxist. Liberals, you ought to be listening to the concerns of conservatives without calling them homophobes and racists and misogynists and anti woke I mean, really? This is the idolatry of today that we are full of. We're full of it. We're full of it with religion, a bad religion. We're full of it with politics, a bad politics. And this is the importance of Phil to be full of it. Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up. It does not mean to say, fill me up, Lord. It does not mean, feel me up, Lord. Feel me. Feel, feel my concerns. Feel my, it's all about me, me, me. It's all about you. A selfish thing whereby my will be done, not thy will be done. That's the problem with the idolatries of religion and politics. It's based on feel me, not fill me. Feel me and my concerns, not fill me with your love and grace. How much self-serving and self-interest masquerades as religion and politics? A feel me faith goes to church to look in my, in the, my mirror. A fill me faith goes to church and look in God's mirror. What a huge difference it is. So what does it mean to be full of it? To live life to the fullness. To the fullest. John 10, I have come that you might have life, that you might have it fully, wholly, abundantly. Let me give you in shorthand what it means to be full of it. I want you, you want your people to be full of it. But what's it? 
It's not religion. It's not politics. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld God's glory, full of grace and truth. To be full of it is the Word, the Logos, became flesh, pathos. Logos became pathos. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is ethos, context. See, to be full of it is for the Logos, to be pathos, to become ethos. We beheld God's glory, the, only, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. This is theos. Full of grace and truth. And the Greek there is holos. A whole life. A full life. An abundant life. So five Greek words. Logos, pathos, ethos, theos. Holos. That's what it means to be full of it. Are you full of the Logos? Are you full of pathos, compassion, and, and love for people? Ethos, do you love your context? Theos, do you trust God and all of this? And are you full of his spirit, God's spirit? And then Holos, as everything comes together in what it means to be full of it, a whole, abundant, full of it life. A life to the fullest. You want fullness? You want fullness in life? Seek Jesus. Fill up on Jesus. The pleroma is talked about in Paul's Colossians 2, 9-10. In him, the whole fullness of God dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him. Our journey toward pleroma, towards fullness, is Christ. Will Reagan wrote a song 10 years ago that Tasha Cobbs nailed it in 2015. I love the initial uh, Kim Walker version of the song. But when Tasha Cobbs sang, Fill Me Up, God, it took the song to a whole new level. A whole new level. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. It ends, fill me up till I overflow. I want to run over, I want to run over. Fill me up till I overflow. I want to run over. I want to run over. It's in the overflow that miracles happen. It's in the overflow that you find that, that pleroma, that holos, that fullness. And when your life in that pleroma, in that overflow, that's when your life levitates in exaltation and exaltation. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. My prayer for you. And the world that, that's full of it. Be full of it. But the it is Christ. Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up. Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember it's more important you prepare the preacher than you prepare the sermon. <laughs>